This is a talk on purity that Don Bosco gave at the oratory to all his young clerics. But it's not just for priests, because everyone can benefit from his advice. I was fascinated at how he connected the virtue of purity to getting out of bed in the morning and moderation in drinking wine. Forget all of the other popular motivational speakers now that are barely even Catholic, because St. John Bosco did it better. His tips for your daily schedule inspire heroic virtue and have a religious backbone that's sorely needed in the discussion of true manliness. Actually, today, January 31st, is St. John Bosco's feast day, and last year, more than 150 episodes ago, I dedicated this channel to Our Lady Help of Christians through the intercession of this great saint. Today, I renew my dedication to her and St. John Bosco. I want to give thanks to God for all of the people that Don Bosco has helped over the past year. However, I can't continue to do these videos without your help. Maybe you haven't noticed, but every single one of these videos are ad-free, which is a rarity on this platform. So please help me keep these episodes free from filthy YouTube ads and become a promoter of St. John Bosco by clicking on the link in the comment section below or by clicking on his logo at the end of the video. Please help me to spread the words of St. John Bosco far and wide. The Miracles and Prophecies of St. John Bosco, a project of America Needs Fatima, I'm your host, Matthew Miller. Don Bosco began his talk to the Salesian clerics with the following words. Our membership seems to keep growing. If I see more of you every time I come here, I pity the poor devil. First, let us thank God for having allowed us to see the end of 1875 and, as we hope, for having started the new year in His holy grace. Let us also look forward to spending this year happily. Now, the last time I talked to you, I said something about your vocation, and I suggested a few means to help you keep it. Today, I will dwell on how to safeguard the fruit of this vocation. When one consecrates himself to the Lord, he offers him all his tendencies and inclinations, and particularly all his virtues. But these we cannot always retain or easily safeguard. This is particularly true of chastity, which is the foundation and hub of all virtues. I don't now intend to describe the beauty of this virtue. Neither years of lengthy lectures nor thousands of heavy tomes can tell of examples of this virtue found in Holy Scripture or narrate the countless miracles performed by our Lord to safeguard it among His devoted ones. Neither do I intend to speak to you about fast or abstinence or the mortification of the senses, practices which so effectively preserve and strengthen this virtue. No, you can read about these things in the lives of the saints, and you'll hear about them in future conferences. But you'll say, Don Bosco is here because he wants to talk to his clerics, whom he loves like the apple of his eye. What then will he tell us? I'll tell you that, especially for a priest and consequently for a young cleric who has consecrated his entire life and virginity to the Lord, chastity is a most precious gem or pearl. At your stage of life, there are some little things you should know which highly contribute to safeguarding such a lovely virtue. Without it, a priest or a cleric is utterly nothing. With it, he is all and holds all treasures in his hands. So let us talk of these little things so helpful and so handy. What are they? We will look at them one by one and you'll see their usefulness. One, to start with, let me say that the exact fulfillment of one's duties will vastly contribute to the preservation of chastity. I'm not referring to your specific duties, such as studying, supervising, teaching catechism, and so on, but rather to what our roles demand from each of us, punctuality in all things, at meals, prayer, night rest, etc. Two, be in the playground during recreation, but be on guard lest this time turn into idle diversion or griping about rules or superiors. Let it be genuine recreation, relaxation of mind and heart after a whole morning's work. After such a recreation, your body too will be refreshed, and each of you will be ready for studying, praying, or teaching. You might ask, but what has recreation to do with chastity? I answer that it most effectively helps to safeguard it. 
Some of you are already supervising the boys or shall very soon do so. You may at times notice that some healthy boy looks troubled, keeps to himself, and when questioned, mumbles nonsense. People who are experienced and can fathom the most hidden recesses of the human heart know that immodest thoughts occupy his mind. They know that if such a boy is not carefully watched, he is likely to seek out some hiding place to read obscene books. They realize that his chastity is in extreme peril. How does this come about? Through idleness during recreation. Isolated from others, he lets his mind wander to fancies he had never heeded before. The more he thinks of those things, the more he likes them, and then it is but a short step to act them out. St. Philip Neri, who was thoroughly versed in this virtue, always told his boys, shout and make all the noise you want, but don't commit sin. His boys carried out his advice with great zest, but at times a lay brother would tear out of his quarters to scold them for their racket as they dashed through the corridors and knocked things over. You rascals, he would shriek, is this the way to behave, breaking everything in sight? But they ignored him and carried on as before with deafening noise. They had their director's permission and that was all that mattered to them. Seeing that they had no intention to obey him, the lay brother would go to St. Philip Neri and indignantly say, I want you to come and scold those scamps. Can't you see they're tearing the whole house down? St. Philip Neri would call them over and say, listen, my sons, stay still if you can and don't scream too loudly. The boys would scatter for new and noisier games while the poor brother would withdraw discomfited and muttering. Were it not for the fact that St. Philip Neri constantly and earnestly told his confreres, never let boys be idle during recreation, the brother would have used forceful means to end that rumpus. I say the same thing to you now. I like to see you run and laugh and have fun. As soon as the recreation period is over, promptly go to your other tasks. Study, for instance. Never neglect it. It is your duty to use every spare moment to increase your knowledge. If it's time for a snack, I urge you to take it, if you need it. When it's time for church, you should go devoutly and give good example, and then return to your studies again. In a word, do everything at the set time, and do it well. Above all, keep all the house rules. 3. Is this enough? Yes, if the timetable is faithfully followed, in its entirety. I have always recommended, and still recommend, and will continue to recommend, that after night prayers, you do your utmost not to linger in conversations with others. After night prayers, go to bed promptly. Those who have to supervise the dormitory should do so with reserve, not stopping to chat with their partner if they have one. It would be even worse to say good night to a boy or a cleric because one word leads to another and the conversation drags on. Chatting after night prayers is not only against the house rules, but is felt by all to be a dangerous thing. Let us keep all rules, especially those concerning the night rest. I can't elaborate now, but what I can and must tell you is that most recent transgressions were mainly due to the fact that some broke this rule and indulged in conversation after night prayers. They gave the boys bad example. Some did worse by inviting their friends for a drink in their own cubicles, a thing which is absolutely forbidden. Each is to stay in his own cubicle and keep out of everybody else's, unless real necessity demands otherwise. On those occasions, some wrote letters and made plans which, though not totally contrary to the virtue of chastity, were still an obstacle to it and caused serious heartaches, not only to me, but also to themselves, since some were forced to leave as a result. Why? Because instead of going to bed at the right time, they stayed up to chat. In the case of some, we weren't sure, but the facts were indisputable as regards others. Their reputation was ruined and they had to leave the oratory because they were unable to safeguard this virtue. Four, some who go to bed late are also late to rise at 5.30 the next morning. 
Well, they think I can sleep another 15 minutes because I can dress, wash, and make my bed in time. 15 minutes later, they reason, oh, I'll just snooze for another five minutes. After all, what's the difference? And so they doze or lie lazily for another five minutes, stretching the time out to 10 or more. Now, how can I get away with this? I know, in one of his works, Cicero says that smart people may tell lies. Besides, lies don't hurt. I'll say I'm sick. My dear boys, acting this way only gives the body more than is good for it. How much feed do farmers give to colts and ponies? Just enough to keep them healthy. Otherwise, they become unmanageable, snap their halters, and kick back. We must do the same with the body. It behaves like a horse or a mule. Overfed, it becomes stubborn and rebellious. As scripture says, he grew fat and frisky. The devil, like a roaring lion, goes about seeking someone to devour. He circles about us, hoping to find something in which to sink his teeth. Besides the noonday devil who assails those who nap through an afternoon, there is also the morning devil, described by the book of Tobias. This devil lures the soul away from prayer, too. When two people pray, the Lord is in their midst, and the Immaculate Lamb gathers their devout prayers to present them to the Eternal Father, obtaining favors, comfort, and the richest rewards for them. Not so those who welcome this devil by lying lazily in bed. Because of sloth, they don't join their companions at prayer, and they suffer the grievous loss of favors they might have received from God. They accustom their body to being lazier. Their constant complaint for more sleep exposes them to the devil's attacks. These lazy fellows are actually looking for trouble. And when temptations arise, will they be able to resist? Will they remain chaste? That will be hardly possible, I assure you. If they resist and don't fall into sin, I would say it's a miracle. But does God always work such miracles? Believe me, no. He will, if necessary, when one has not placed himself into an occasion of sin and without that help clearly cannot be snatched from the devil's clutches. Some may say, I have always been slow to rise and I never fell. In that case, I ask, you mean you never consented to bad thoughts, desires, or deeds? If they insist that they didn't, then I say quite openly, if you're telling me the truth, the Lord has performed a great miracle to save you. That's the end of part one of this sermon. And if you'd like to hear part two, please subscribe and come back to the channel on Friday. Thank you all so much for watching and thank you for all the support we've received through this past year of posting. God bless you and Our Lady keep you.